Okay, so my name is Mia Bayes and welcome to a Reclaim the Frame special take, curational takeover around women make film. Um, welcome to Kit Griffiths. Uh, we first had a really quite mad and uh, an innovative um, exploration of the film Yentl together, uh, where we were touring, we were reframing Star Island. Actually, it was almost exactly a year ago and we did a fabulous event at Broadway Nottingham and um, Kit did a, um, a kind of existential exploration of Yentl playing both of the, the lead characters. And so after we'd had a quite immense conversation with a female rabbi who was talking about how inspirational the film had been to her. And then we decided to do something bespoke and commissioned Kit around Portrait of a Lady on Fire, the mistress piece by Sunin Tiana. Um, and so we asked to also then collaborate around Women Make Film, which is a kind of monumental 2020 um, series about um, the um, input of female directors across the history of cinema by Mark Cousins, which we've done a lot of work around. And um, so I would like to welcome Kit, who will talk about uh, what they do and also about the work around Women Make Film and what the, what the series was meant to them. Kit. Hello. Um... Yes, what what an education. Um, yeah, thank you, Mark Cousins, for making this. Uh, so it's 14 hours. Um, it's a real, real epic documentary. And uh, it's been described as uh, a film school of sorts. Um, and it's, it's very technical. That's the that's the beauty. That's what I'm what I'm getting at with the, the film school element is it's not it's not like a couple of hundred biopics um, of great female filmmakers it's analyzing their films it's getting in there and going this is the film this is an excellent moment this is why um and so yeah you're just getting straight down to their work which is incredible film is the medium that i connected with most as a child um i I'm from working class, single parent background in Wales. We didn't go to the theater much um, slash at all. Um, didn't have a bookshelf in every home, but we did have films. You know, our major treat of the week was if we could afford to go to Blockbuster um, and pick films. And I was, you know, that like 10 year old heading straight for the world cinema section uh, and the LGBTQ section, just going like, I need something different. I need something different to my tiny little nook of the world. Um, so film really helped me to escape before I could physically go out and, and walk about the world. And it was only a few years ago that I was um, living somewhere as a property guardian, which essentially means you pay to squat. Uh, it's a way to exist in London as an artist, um, or it was before they pushed the prices up. Um, and I had basically done out my home very, very beautifully. And when, so when I got my notice for that place, you know, I've always had, I've always written loads of screenplays. I've always had the films going on in my head and on pages, um, very affordable pieces of paper and, you know, Word documents. Um, when my I got my notice for this um, property that I was living in that I really loved, I was like, oh, I'm a set, set, location. It's one of the most expensive parts of film and I'm about to lose it in three weeks time. So I was like, screw it, let's film. And I borrowed equipment. I rang around everyone I knew. I was like, hey, 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 can I, can you help me out? Can I, you know, I took night buses across town to borrow equipment for just 12 hours and then return it. And I basically just shot and shot and shot for three weeks. Um, but this is, you know, th this film is, is like budget of like 70 pounds, I think, uh, is what I paid Annie for a few hours help. Um, and so it's just been really affirming to see that with so little, um, the work really connected with quite a lot of people. So now I'm going like, okay, Okay, let's let's step it up. Before we get into the selection kit, um, when was the first? What was the first queer representation on screen on the big screen that that kind of really the really impacted you? Oh, um, no, I know what it was. Okay, so Channel Five, late at night. I think I'm like nine years old, and Bound, Bound comes on. Um, do you know the film Bound? The Wachowskis. Was it the Wachowskis? Yep. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. Yep. Oh, dreamy. Okay. When, yeah, before the transitions. 
Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Bound, it, for anyone who doesn't know, is a gangster film. It also has a strong lesbian romance uh, at, at its center. And I was just, the character of Corgi, you know, <laughs> she's come out of jail. She's in her white top with her tattoos and she's doing DIY for the neighbor downstairs. That was my dream. That was my absolute dream was to be Corgi. Um, and the, the thing that really got me about that film was that it's a good gangster film. It's, it's a really good gangster film. And they happen to be lesbians. And that was just really, really cool. Really cool, yeah. Awesome. So let's start, let's go through the, the list. So all of these films are in Women Make Film. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, let's, so what's, what's up first? Okay, so first one is Celine Sciamma's Tomboy. Um, oh, this, this is so beautiful. Um, I think even just the, the title makes it so accessible to so many people queer or not, who had that time in their lives as a child where you were a boy. Um, to me, it was like, um, I thought tomboy meant like, um, it, it was a type of boy. It wasn't a type of girl to me. And this sort of like gray area kind of allows um, us to not have to um, stress too much about the fact that we're boys you know I was definitely a boy and everyone was saying tomboy and I was like yeah okay that'll do um and, and yeah so Celine Sciamma's was tomboy um it's the Mark Cousins chooses a tiny little moment the whole film is so subtle and full of so many beautiful moments um and I don't want to give too many spoilers so I'll just talk about the one that Mark uses um it's it's covered under the conversation section and basically the premise of the film is that this child, Law, goes to a new area, moves home, and when Law is being asked their name, they say, Michael. And just by saying that, Law never says, I'm a boy. Law just gives the boy's name and then lives as a boy. And that's it. That's, you know, and that's so powerful and so simple. Um, you know, I've only been kit for six years, but it's it's what feels right because it means that people are making a slightly different presumption about who I am. Um, and yeah, we watch this this character, Michael, um, live as the boy that they are. Um, and obviously there are there are consequences and, and it's difficult. And there's excellent stuff on um, packing, you know, on bodily adjustment um that is really sweet and really beautiful um but the the conversation bit that mark cousins hones in on is at the end of the summer the girl that um that michael spent the whole summer with asks again michael's name and michael says law um and the amazing thing there is that it's gone from a boy's name to a girl's name but guess what law is exactly who law is it's the same little boy or non-binary person or masculine girl whatever you know we don't know what what law would define themselves as later in life but it's the same person they say a different name and there's just this little smile where the 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 girl their friend just gets it it's like yep you're, you're still exactly the same and now we'll start again without the secrecy and it's stunning everybody needs to watch this film yeah, so, yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. Stunning, stunning, beautiful, moving work. Yeah. Fresh one, in terms of representation, really unusual and fresh. Yes, yeah, definitely. We are so used to these real trauma narratives around um, all queer issues. And it's just so refreshing to be starting to see films. I mean, Tomboy is 2011, um, and, but more and more films are happening now where it's like, yes, there may be trauma. You know, we, films look at h hard bits in life, but it's not uh, trauma, 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 trauma. You'll never recover from this film. This is trans life. It's not that. Um, and that's why I, I think, yeah, Tomboy is, is such an essential watch for any, anybody, anybody, everybody. What's next? Maybe you've just mentioned it. Hey? What's next? What do you want to talk about next? What do I want to talk about next? Um, quickly, I do want to recommend XXY. Um, 
just on the theme of kind of like gender fluidity, that's about an intersex person. Um, uh, I just want to throw in some extra films because it's like, there's never enough, there's never enough. So XXY is also beautiful um, and is about an intersex child um, whose parents are trying to make lean towards one decision or another. Um, and for me, that doesn't make any sense. As I was 18 when XXY came out um, and I just saw the poster and I was like, oh, that's me, I'm both. Um, and I went um, and then I discovered it was about somebody who was, uh, you know, biologically intersex. And I was like, oh, it's not me. And then by the end of the film, I was like, oh no, it is me. Um, so yeah, XXY is also a really beautiful um, look at gender fluidity. Um, but yes, yeah, so my second film of the, please definitely watch all of these six films is uh, Donna Deitch's Desert Hearts. Uh, yeah, this one is just so, so dreamy. Um, have you seen Desert Hearts, Mia? Oh, hello. Time, though, it, was re it was such a seminal film. Actually, I worked in the company that was a very, well, my first job was in a queer distribution company. Well, it was actually part straight, I am part queer. And, and so they, re they released Poison, they released Desert Hearts, a lot of these really seminal works that were mm -hmm. kind of completely, literally like a single kind of blooming cactus in a literally in a desert where you know you never saw representation such as this. Yeah. And, so, and, and it was such a classic for that. Yeah. It, do you know, it, it's absolutely stunning. It's, I mean, visually stunning as well. The, the outfits, the the scenery the light the music most of the budget apparently went to acquiring all of the music rights and there's there's like i don't know like 40 incredible um songs something mad um it's a gorgeous film it has it's it has its tough spots it's got this one character who she's like an alcoholic uh older lady figure who our protagonist it's i think she's the stepmom um, and the protagonist wants that mum figure, but the mum's a, she's a bit of a monster and she's homophobic, but she's, she's who's there and you deal with it. And um, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful film. And I would say actually for this one, that the ways in which Desert Hearts has dated are really amusing. Surprise nudity is something that uh, you see in quite a lot of films. Um, and it's really so and this has happened to me in real life um, where I've like been having cheese and wine with someone in my home and I've nipped to the loo and then I've come back and they're fully naked on the bed. Um, and there's an equivalent of that in Desert Hearts. And it's it's just not consensual to just it's 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 flashing, um, you know, but it's it's the sort of detail that in the context of the whole film, it's not horrifying. It's just like. It's dated, but it's uh, it's very fun. It's very, you know, it's, it doesn't take away. I think it adds something. And I feel a bit like that about some of the shots, like the kind of like slow fades from of, of the screen from um, left to right to show the passing of time. These are things that, they're decisions that I don't think the director would make today, but they just sort of like add to this kind of like cult, slightly corny elements of what is genuinely a really stunning film. I can't wait to revisit that actually. Yeah, yeah please do. Please yeah. do. Um, okay, what's, what's next, Kip? So, um, number three um, is a film called The Silences of the Palace. It's a Tunisian film by, I think, Mufida Talati uh, as the director. And this, um, the reason that I've chosen this one, so it's not it's not obvious in terms of its queerness um, because there's a lot of straight people in it. Um, but it's about sex work. Actually, sex workers have always been, there's a huge overlap in queerness and sex work. Um, this is one of, it's now one of my favorite films um, and I would never have found it if it wasn't for Women Make Film. So when you're watching Women Make Film, you, you can tell just from the slice that Mark takes, you can tell which films are for you, especially, you know? I mean, they're all good films, but you can go like, like with this one, it's the opening shot. It's a tight close up on a, a wedding singer. It's, it's, and it's the protagonist and her 
face is so sad and so beautiful and you can hear the the chatter of her being ignored you can feel that she's at an event and then it cuts to a pan across um the wedding scene and um I knew from that shot that I needed to see this film because it it was just so stunning um and it is now absolutely one of my favorite films what is really interesting is that the protagonist's mother is a sex worker but it's she's not actually cast out um or looked down on by her um her her own community so she basically she lives in the palace as a, a palace worker she you know she makes the tea she makes the food just like uh, or everyone else but because she's exceptionally beautiful she is also expected to have sex with um with the the, the prince the man of the house um and it's really interesting because the, of course there are moments of shame um of course there are moments of trauma there are but but overall the film is very very um nuanced it's very beautiful and there's real joy there's real mirth at one point um one of the other house workers laughs their head off and says about the the um the people in charge you know the upper classes says you know that these rich people they're jealous of our poverty the the study of 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 patriarchy in it close up is really incredible and you know i, I actually i i feel sorry for the the man uh, at the head of the house um, at more than one moment. And I think that's a real achievement and it allows us to kind of like critique the system, um, this, this huge thing, this patriarchy, um, to critique it, to critique ourselves and other people within it, but without going like, it's you, it's your fault. It's like, we're all human. It's a big mess. Um, let's have a look at this trauma and get to the root of it and yeah. Love it. Every, everyone needs to watch this film. The Silences of the Palace. Yeah, it's gorgeous. That, that came out in, in it's, it's 94, I think. It's Tunisia. Yeah. And it's set in the 50s, isn't it? Under French colonial yeah. wars. Yes. So that's happening in, that's happening in the background. Yeah. And that's really, that's really interesting because it's kind of like outside. So this is like a protected little community, yeah. aware of change and danger. Um, yeah, it's really stunning. Yeah. Really, really stunning. Wonderful, thank you, Kit. Okay, what's next? Cool, um, so next, sort of going further into who, who's queer, who comes under the, the family bracket. Um, I've gone for um, Ildiko and Yeti's On Body and Soul um, from 2017. So this is, it's, a, it's romance, it's hetero, but it is not normative. Um, and this is a really important thing for me, um, looking at neurodiversity um, in particular, um, Asperger's and um, autism. Um, people who are told and who feel this extra, e extra differences in the way that they conduct relationships, well, they are, they are struggling a lot under, you know, heteronormative expectations too. You know, if you've got your whole family saying to you, like, why don't you have a boyfriend? Why don't you have a boyfriend? Why don't you have a boyfriend? It's very similar to, you know, to somebody saying that to me. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole different experience, but you see there, there are huge connections. And so these people are queer to me. And, and this film is, is queer. It's about a queer um, love story. It's unexpected. It's, it's completely unconventional. Um, and it's really beautiful. Have you seen it, Mia? Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's stunning, isn't it? And it's um, it's a it's a it's a slow burn. Um, I did at one point cry out in pain, uh, while watching it. So it's a slow burn with its with its peaks. Um, but yeah, the the um female protagonist um it, who has autism, which again is really important because like we're, we're never previously like the amount of girl, young girls who have been diagnosed with autism you know traditionally is so much fewer and they're going oh it's a it's a thing that only boys have and it's like no it's not it's we're only looking at the boys when basically we're teaching girls from the word go from the moment we pop out into the world we're teaching females 
how to please, how to smile, how to fit in. So of course we don't notice autism so much in girls, but that's starting to change a lot. It's changing a lot in, in child psychology. You know, the, the studies are now being evened out and the art is representing our, our interests growing and deepening um, and just becoming more honest, more authentic. Beautiful, thank you, Kit. What's up next? So number five, um, this is a cult classic, uh, Cheryl Dunyer's The Watermelon Woman. Uh, I, I think almost to like remedy my last two choices, which have had straight people in them. I'm just like, here's this film with hundreds of lesbians. Um, it's, yeah, it's hilarious. It's genius. Um, it's, 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 so it's 1987. It's a mockumentary, documentary, some call it a rom-com. I would, I mean, if you're looking to watch a rom-com, I wouldn't be like, watch The Watermelon Woman. Um, but it is incre incredibly ambitious. There are so many different layers of reality happening, but all of it is real. You know, all of it is true, even if um, there are, at points, there are fictions being used. She has a white girlfriend that she's dating in it. Um, and the, there's so many cringe moments that just like, you're laughing and you're just like, oh, it's awful, it's awful, it's awful. Um, but she's not a totally, she's not a hundred percent awful. There's like moments that are nice as well. Cheryl talks about, oh, I think she's in the family. And whenever Dunye says that, what she means is, I think they're gay. Um, and so this is kind of like what I'm talking about as well, this idea of family, but obviously in the Watermelon Woman, there's, there's more, there's, there's the gay family and there's the black POC family. There is an ex incredible history here, there's incredible family. Um, and this film just takes you right into it and gives you this like huge, big um, patchwork of, of people and of different times in history. And, and you learn, you know, you learn a bit. Um, it's yeah, it's doing a lot of things and it's fantastic. It's corny. It's essential watching for every lesbian. The Watermelon Woman. <laughs> because that's a film that I've never seen. You've never seen it? No. See, I, I, because films like this have just been so hard to see for yeah. a long time. Like, and I, because I really don't like watching on YouTube. I really yeah with that. I think I paid for it on YouTube though. £2.50. Yeah, recently it's become yeah. available, but it's only literally been in about, I think yeah. it's on BFI player as well, but it's really only been in about the last year or something. But yeah. that's, yeah, that's always been on the list. And um, yeah, I've got to catch it then. And while, while we're talking about uh, The Watermelon Woman, uh, side glance to uh, Lizzie Borden's uh, Born in Flames, which came before The Watermelon Woman and does a lot of similar things. I feel like Cheryl Dunye must have been inspired by Lizzie Borden's um, Born in Flames, definitely. So it's, it's very much, it's got this mockumentary style as well and different layers of reality, but Born in Flames um, looks at, uh, it's, it's like a, fantasy, it's like a fantasy imagining of a woman's movement that involves something called the woman's army. And um, at the, towards the beginning, there's like a white radio voiceover. You can just now hear that he's white. Um, and he's like, a woman's army appears to be dominated by blacks and lesbians. It gets a lot of the different characters around that activism very, very right. You know, you've got these very um, wordy, educated white women with their, their hearts and their politics in the right place, but contrasted with, you know, them sort of talking about the actions of the army and what they're doing and what does that mean? And, and sort of like sitting around for like 10 minutes, just sort of like pontificating on what that means, but then using using what skills they have to put stuff out in the newspaper. And um, it's it's done humorously, it's very funny. Um, and it's, it's great watching. I especially recommend it to activists born in flames, but yes, so. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked because there are so many films that everybody needs to watch. Um, but yeah, so on to my sixth one, shall I? Well, I've gone for Tank Girl. Um, now Tank Girl, I'm being so naughty here. Tank Girl is another person who is technically heterosexual um, in my curated queer list. Um, her boyfriend dies at the beginning, he gets murdered. And then her next boyfriend is a mutant soldier who is basically a kangaroo. Now that's that's not normative, Mia. That's not normative. And there's a great, great moment when she when she meets the um these mutant army people who are all male, it would appear, uh, and they're basically half kangaroo. Um 
and they're having dinner and she's just like, okay, so then after dinner, we get the guns. Um, and the leader of the mutants who's uh, played by Ice-T is just like, oh no, 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 we're, we're not interested in guns. And then like stands up and starts reciting poetry and all of these like super butch looking, they've been mutated specifically to fight. They're half kangaroos, but they're all there like listening to the leader recite poetry over dinner. And one of them starts crying. And it's just like the the subversion of the sub, all of the subversions in Tank Girl are so beautiful, so silly so fun so colorful there are there are dark bits you know there's there's a lot of um violence and, and aggression but it's um in terms of like apocalyptic watching it's at the top of my list of things that will only make you feel better what a what a great fun silly inspiring queer movie that is yeah <laughs> just to round up actually i mean what's what it's making me think about reflect upon is how most of the films that you've lifted up are kind of 80s 90s or so sort of yeah thousands. of the 80s and 90s ones all of those um directors really struggled to to follow up those films or uh, or like a film like tank girl was a spectacular it's a flop disaster yeah. was considered spectacular disaster yeah and, and how, you know, sadly, the history of, of female directors around that, those eras is, is of like managed decline. You know, they make these incredible films. Some of them, you know, didn't work commercially, but then was Tank Girl really given a chance? I'm not sure actually. Um, and then other films were just, you know, have existed as cult classics, but still that hasn't been enough to give the directors a chance to do more. It's sad. It's sad to 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 think what films could have come next and didn't. But I'm just incredibly grateful that these films were made in order for the filmmakers who now have uh, more bandwidth to make and make and make. You know, we've been inspired by these films and we continue to be inspired by these films. So their legacy is still going, even if it's not as large a legacy as they deserve. Yeah, yeah, please say good point. Thank you. For it. 2020 films uh, to, to look up, uh, Cocoon uh, by Leonie Krippendorf. Um, I watched that last week. I, when's it being released, Mia? Um, this Mid-December. Mid-December, okay. Um, it's the coming of age narrative and uh, I'm so happy to see how the details of coming of age narratives are changing because the reality is changing. You know, we open the film and there are her older sister who's straight, who is an incredible character. Really, really love the sister character. Um, is with her friends and being bitchy and you're like, oh, okay, yeah. So these, these, these girls are straight and they're horrible and this character is quiet because they're gay and they're gonna be nice. Um, and so it has this sort of like quite traditional setup. And then that's not the case at all. That's absolutely not the case. All of the characters are very varied. It just creates this whole new picture where you go, okay, so I'm gay and I'm a teenager. Fundamentally being teenage is horrific. Adolescence is a horrible experience, but the being gay bit might not be the trauma, trauma, trauma that we traditionally have seen. Um, and that's really exciting. So that's Cocoon, um, that's a, out mid, mid December. And another um, filmmaker who I really, really, really love um, is Alice Wu. Um, so Alice Wu's film out this year is the half of it, uh, coming of age, queer teenage. Um, Alice Wu is a Chinese American director. Uh, when I saw her uh, Saving Face in 2014, I was 17 years old and I watched Saving Face every night for like seven nights in a row when I first saw it. And it's one of those films that is just and a bit like the film, the half of it, that what Alice Wu does really well um, is a kind of like sweetness. Her characters are so likable, especially um, the Chinese father in um, the half of it. Just, oh, really beautiful. And actually the mother in, in um, Saving Face. So both of these are first generation um, Chinese immigrants in America, these parent characters, both completely different. Joan Chen is in Saving Face, um, stunning performance. Um, but yeah, if, you, if you're looking for a film that, um, where you go like, I want to watch a film, but I just, I don't want anything too difficult. I want it to be nice. I want to, you know, watch Alice Wu. And then, sorry Mia, I know we're, we're pushed for time, but one more, one more film out in 2020, 
you and I were talking the other day about how great Netflix um, is with their programming, um, as, as lately especially, uh, Disclosure, um, obviously that's that's Sam Fed Sam Fedder uh, has directed that, so not a female director. Um, but yeah, they had real trouble uh, getting funding for this film. Um, and then when it got to Cannes, uh, it had a 10 minute standing ovation. Everybody watched Disclosure. If you are trans, if you know trans people, if you don't know trans people, if you're not sure about trans people, if you got a few problems, if you're a bit JK Rowling on the subject, watch Disclosure. It's just interesting and it's useful and it's beautiful and it's it's positive. So yeah, Disclosure is, is a must see for everybody, um, queers and all. Yeah, I found Disclosure really inspiring on many levels, but particularly around the idea of image activism and, and mm -hmm. films like Disclosure, um, um, for people with disabilities, how just important it is to not just have, you know, that people who about whom we really never hear or see speaking mm -hmm. for themselves, but also being shot by um, people who are like them. And, you know, that's just so rare. And also yeah. doing it in a way that is breaking stereotypes and, and not doing it in a tragic way, as you said before, that, you know, mm -hmm. just is the same you know it's so often the kind of tragic story yeah and and how important this is for people who do not represent in those ways to watch and listen and learn from and that's why image activism is just so essential it it, it can change things so how shall we wrap up kit Tell you what, Mia, maybe you need to try and get on the line our women make film correspondent on the road yes Right. <laughs> we need to find Tilda Swinton's glove handler. <laughs> We've not heard from him in a while. Um, yeah. So I mean, last last time we saw Caesar, I think he'd crashed the car um, and was out in the woods crying with blood on his forehead. Um, yeah, it was bad. Yeah. Have, have you got the? Have you got the? Is I don't know who's operating the Zoom. Can we get Caesar on the line? Yeah, should we try? Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, here he is. Caesar, can you hear me? <gasps> it's double O, Caesar, to you. You didn't really think I was trying to find Tilda Swinton's driving glove, did you? <laughs> I mean, I was. I mean, I would love to know. I kind of still am looking for it, but I'm also working for somebody else. It's a pretty sweet deal. I get power, I get respect, I get snacks. And all I have to do is drive around the world woman-proofing all the major film institutes. It's pretty hard work, actually. You know, yesterday, I spent the whole day laying cattle gridding across cans, you know, so, so the ladies can't get across it in their, their stiletto heels. And three days ago, I was at the BFA, that's the uh, Beijing Film Academy, and um, I was trying to teach local men how to distract film-curious women and deter them from entering the academy using this uh, classic manual. And uh, yeah, I ended up in a massive homosexual orgy, which was also tiring. Oh, and bad for my suit. <laughs> Scotland now to assassinate Mark Cousins. You know, I thought Mark would turn out to be a double agent for the patriarchy, because there were parts of that voiceover script where I thought he was taking the mech. You know, I mean, so for example, in uh, in that gorgeous uh, interior bus shot full of sunlight in Murtover's 1990 film, The Aesthetic Syndrome, you know, when, when he's describing it through the uh, sweet melodic voice of Tilda Swinton, and he says, is it the vehicle moving, or is it the sun? Of course it's the vehicle moving. Why are you trying to make Tilda sound stupid and pretentious? I mean, she, she always sounds pretentious, but not stupid. And how about in the, uh, the uh, character introduction chapter, when he has Tilda, he has Tilda describe a working class character as Gobby? Sabotage much? But no, apparently everybody involved was being totally sincere. 
So the patriarchy you want Mark dead. Um, you, you don't happen to have his address, do you, Mia? Actually, don't worry. I, I've taken enough of your time. I'm just gonna hit Glasgow and ask around. You take care now, Mia. It's been great chatting with you.